This video covers part of the content for the Cloud APIs virtual event, which is all about using APIs on SAP Cloud Platform. The content is available on GitHub, and this particular exercise, exercise five, covers workflow API calls, authorities, access token contents, and more. And it's a, one of a number of exercises in a group called Learning with the Workflow API. So let's start. It's quite a lengthy exercise compared to the previous ones. We'll take it step by step, but hopefully we'll get to know what's required to make actual calls to the workflow API in this exercise. At this point, we've got everything from the previous exercises. We've got everything we need to make uh, the workflow calls, the API calls. We've got uh, an App Studio dev space. We've got some tools in that dev space as well. We've got a workflow definition that we've uh, already deployed to a service instance, an instance of the workflow service that we've created as well. And we've also created a service key for that instance that has OAuth 2.0 authentication details as well, which we'll need in this exercise. So let's start with step one, where we're going to prepare for making our first workflow API call. Well, we've got a workflow definition deployed. Why don't we try and use the API to request a list of workflow definitions, and therefore we should see that freshly deployed workflow definition in the list. Seems like a good place to start. So if we jump over to the API hub, let's open this up in a new tab, and look at the workflow API for Cloud Foundry API details, which you've seen before in the workflow definitions group here, we can see straight away the very first thing we're presented with in this list is what we're looking for. V1 workflow definitions, it's a get request to this endpoint, and that will give us a list of all workflow definitions. So that's what we're looking for here. And that's the screenshot here too. We can send a get request to this path here, this endpoint, but of course this is relative. This is a relative path, so it's relative to what? Well, if we look at the details of the workflow API for Cloud Foundry API, we can see the URLs here, and there'll be a URL that corresponds to the region where you have your trial sub account. Now, the one that we're using here is in EU10, so that effectively is the API base for the workflow API for Cloud Foundry for us, okay? So this is the base resource server URL from an OAuth 2.0 role perspective. Okay, we can see that screenshot here. Um, now, when we think back to what we looked at in exercise two, looking specifically at the general details of OAuth 2, we know that these workflow APIs are protected by OAuth 2 and specifically using the client credentials grant type. So what we need to be able to make calls to the workflow API are OAuth 2.0 client credential details. And if we think back to the flow, an OAuth 2 flow generally, we'll remember that API calls are made effectively in stages. Not every API call is made in multiple stages, but the first one, our very first one, is going to be made in stages. The first stage is to go and request and obtain an access token. And in the second and subsequent requests, we use that access token in actual calls to the API endpoints. Okay, so we'll think of it in the preparation stage at least in two parts. So in order to retrieve the access token, we need information in our service key. Okay, and we've got the service key in that workflow light sk1.json file that we saved the service key details, the service key JSON into. Okay, so let's have a quick look at that. Let's open up the workflow light sk1 JSON file here. We can see that all the details that we need for retrieving or requesting an access token and then using the access token against the endpoint are in this file here. So as it says here, the information that we need is in our service key. And in order to obtain an access token, we need to send a request to the authorization server specifically to the, the well-known endpoint, the token request endpoint, slash OAuth slash token. So it's the authorization server URL with slash OAuth slash token at the end. So for requesting the access token, 
i.e. for stage one, we're going to need three pieces of information. The base URL of the authorization server, to which we then would append slash OAuth slash token. That base URL is in the URL property within the UAA group in the service key. We also need the client ID and the client secret, which will be used as a sort of username and password in the access token request. And we can get those from the client ID and client secret properties also in the UAA group. So let's have a look at that first. In the UAA group here, we can see that we've got the client ID and the client secret, and we've also got the URL. So we know we've got all those details. Looking at the details that we need for stage two for actually making calls to the API endpoints, we need, of course, not only what path for the specific API we want to call, but we also need the base URL, i.e. this thing here, the base URL for the resource server. That base URL, the resource server base URL, is also in the service key file, and it's in the property workflow rest URL in the endpoints section, which is exactly here, endpoints workflow rest URL. So that is the resource server base URL, at the end of which you can append the different API endpoint paths, for example, slash v1 slash workflow definitions. And the other thing, of course, we need in stage two is the access token that we received, hopefully, in the call in stage one. Okay, so far so good. So let's skip now to the App Studio itself. Let's just put these pages side by side so we can see what's going on. And it's worth pointing out that the App Studio supports a number of uh, VS Code extensions, one of which, uh, and it's pre-installed for us, one of which is the REST client. And that means that we have a convenient way of making simple HTTP calls by defining the calls themselves in files ending .http. So there's a file in the workflow API directory called first API call .http in the repo. So you should have this as well. Let's have a look at this file and let's make sure we understand what it's doing for us. So this file contains two HTTP requests. And I'm sure you can guess that the first HTTP request represents stage one, which is where we request the token. And the second HTTP request is gonna represent stage two, where we use the access token in the actual call to make the API call to the workflow definitions endpoint. Okay, the two calls are separated by a line with these three hashes in them. So that's how the REST client divides up the different HTTP requests. And the REST client extension in App Studio will automatically insert these little send request links, which you can use to actually make the request. Okay, so that's not part of the file. The, the extension just recognizes these HTTP requests and gives us a link to click to make those requests. However, we can't make them yet because we've got some placeholders that we need to fill in in this exercise. So that's what we're directed to do here. Replace each of the placeholders, including the actual square brackets, for the first HTTP call with the values you've gathered earlier in this step. So let's just have a look where these placeholders are. So the first placeholder is in the actual URL. So this is the URL of the authorization server. And that we know is in the UAA.URL. So why don't we actually drag down here, really conveniently, drag down the file so we can see them both at the same time in the App Studio. And this is the URL that we want. So let's copy that and replace that placeholder with that. So now we can see that the HTTP request we've got here is a post request to the authorization server endpoint to the well-known OAuth token path info, which means that this is, this is a request for an access token. We need to authenticate this request, and we authenticate this request with the client ID and the client secret, client ID and client secret, 
also from the service key. So let's grab those now. Now notice that uh, this is a effectively a basic authentication header, but instead of having a colon between the effective username and effective password here, the REST client will allow us to use a white space so that we can avoid strange characters and special characters getting mixed up with the rather unusually looking client ID and client secret values. So that's what we'll do. Make sure you respect and leave the white space here and let the REST client take care of the combining and encoding into base64 for you. So I'm gonna copy the client ID carefully and replace that placeholder. And then I'm gonna copy the client secret. Again, I'm not using any of the double quotes, of course. There's the client secret. So now we have the complete call. Of course, just notice that we're passing in the payload in the body of this post request. The body is separated by a blank line here. We're passing a name and value pair saying the grant type is client credentials. And in order to uh, declare what type of content in the body we have that we're sending, of course, we send a content type header, which of course is the standard sort of form based header. So we're ready to make the first call. We're ready to make the stage one call. We've got an example of uh, what the call should look like just before you make it, so you can compare it with what you've done yourself. Notice here that you know these, these values have been sort of truncated, elided with dots, but there is this white space here. Okay, so now we can use this REST client send request facility to actually make the call. Let's see what happens. Okay, let's move this down a bit. And what we can see is the response, the HTTP response. That was the request. And this is the response. And what we can see is that we've actually successfully obtained an access token in a client credentials flow based call. We can see that the response gives us a 200. We can also see the response has something in the payload in the body and it's JSON just out of interest, if we can see the content type is JSON there. And it contains a number of things, including, and most importantly, including an access token, which is there. Okay, so now let's move to step two, where we can actually complete stage two, which is making the actual workflow API call. This is stage two of the two stage process we saw in step one. Okay, and in this step, we're going to make a GET request to the V1 Workflow Definitions API endpoint. Okay, that is the request that's described here in the Workflow API for Cloud Foundry API details on the API hub. So V1 Workflow Definitions GET. That's what we want. Let's just jump straight back to number two again. There we go. Okay, so it says focus now on the second HTTP request in this file, which is this one. And we can see that actually it's somewhat simpler because first of all, it's a GET request. So normally in a GET request, you wouldn't send a body, you wouldn't send a payload, and that's the case here. But we've got some placeholders to, to, uh, to fix, to address. So the first placeholder that we need to address is the placeholder that is effectively representing the resource server base URL, the thing we saw in the previous step in this exercise. We know where that is. That's in the endpoints group, the workflow rest URL in the service key. And there it is, in fact, let's just copy that and replace this placeholder with that. So there is the fully qualified URL for the list workflow definitions API endpoint. However, we're not done because of course we've now, as we saw in the stage descriptions, we've now got to supply the access token that we received in the response to the call in stage one. And the access token, of course, is this thing here. So let's copy all of it. Again, not using the double quotes and paste it in here. The access token retrieved from the previous request, paste. It's gonna be a single line, which is fine. We don't want to insert any 
extraneous white space. But also make sure you do preserve the space between the bearer keyword and the actual access token. So there's a space here, of course. All right, so let's just bring that back to the start. And we're ready to make our first API call. So let's use send request to do so. Hmm. Do we get a response like this? Yes, we do. Is this what we're expecting? 403 forbidden? User does not have sufficient privileges? Well, no, we weren't really expecting that, were we? The response code returned, 403, basically tells us that you don't have access to do this. Did we get the client ID and client secret wrong? Well, no, because that successfully ended up in us being granted an access token. So stage one, requesting and obtaining the access token was successful. So it looks like the identity that's represented by the access token is recognized, but that identity doesn't have the appropriate access for this particular API call. So let's dig into that a little bit more. In step three, we're gonna inspect the contents of the access token to see if we can find out what's going on. So where are we? We've got an access token and it's not working for us. So we can consider as well that, as it says here as well, using the REST client is very convenient in many, many circumstances. But for this sort of thing where we have a two-stage call and we've got to take the output of one call and feed it into the input of another call, this is the access token, for example, it's quite cumbersome. Um, there are many, many ways of making API calls because essentially they're, they're just HTTP calls. One way is using Postman, which we'll do later on in a future exercise in this virtual event. Another way is to use the very convenient uh, environments mechanism in the API hub itself. But one way to do it really, really nicely and understand what we're doing as well is to do it ourselves, to use a script, to use command line tools so we can really dig down, know what we're doing and control what we're doing. So that's what we're gonna do here because that means also we can remain in the Business Application Studio, but we can stay close to the flow. Okay, so what does that mean? What am I talking about? Well, if we have a look in the uh, Explorer, in the Workflow API directory, we can see we've got a file called Workflow. And of course, there's a link here as well if you want to look at it, if you're just looking at the exercises right now. And there's a workflow file, it's in the GitHub repo. Let's close that as well. But let's look at it in here. So let's open up the workflow file. And as we can close that workflow light like sk1json for now. So the workflow file is a script. It's a longer script than we've seen before, but actually it's fairly straightforward and it's sort of been deliberately kept to a minimum it has room for improvement, of course, but it does exactly what we want it to do. So they've got a little, I've got a little description here of what this script does. So we can read this at your leisure, but let's go through it very, very briefly. Going from top to bottom, we're doing the same thing as we did before. We're using the source command to bring in those shared variables. Remember those shared variables here? And then we've got a whole load of function definitions. Okay, and these function, each of the function definitions is effectively wrapping a call to the curl command, which is you know our, our command line HTTP client. Or there's actually a function here that uses the CF command, okay? After the list of functions, we've got this command variable. Now the command variable is sort of just used to list the possible functions, and this is used elsewhere to allow or enable shell completion, command completion, which is not implemented here right now but this is a nice convenient way of sort of getting an overview of what this script offers. Then we have a section called service key value retrieval. And this is basically using JQ to do exactly what we've just done in the previous steps to go and grab the values from the service key file and put them into variables. So this is using JQ to retrieve the client ID property within the UAA group from the service key file 
And then whatever comes out of that is assigned to the client ID variable. Same thing for the client secret, same thing for the authorization server, and also same thing for the workflow REST URL. So this is a really nice way. In fact, why don't we just do one of these right now manually so we can see what we're doing. In fact, let me just open up the workflow API directory, directory in a terminal there, and just do one of these. So we'll, we'll source that variable file. So we've got access to, for example, the key file name. So we can say jq minus r just means raw, don't put it in quotes, dot uaa dot uh, URL, for example, I'm going to do this one here for the auth server, right? And read the JSON from a file called whatever's in the variable key file, which is of course workflow light sk1.json. And that will give us that value. And then this assignment here will assign that value to a variable called auth server. So that's all that's going on there. And then finally, we have a little sort of case statement here. If we don't specify a command when we run the workflow script, then it just prints out what's in that commands variable as in it lists the possible commands. Otherwise, it goes and gets an access token using one of the functions here, get access token is up here, and then carries out the command, whatever command we gave. For example, list workflow definitions, which is exactly what we want to do. So again, I just want to emphasize the script is deliberately basic. There are plenty of opportunities for improvement, but I wanted to keep it as simple as possible so that we can all understand it. Also, some of you will be shouting at the video, shouting at me saying, but, 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 we don't need to retrieve an access token, a fresh access token, every time we want to carry out one of these API calls. That is absolutely true, but for simplicity's sake, and to keep the script as simple as possible, we're just doing that. We're doing it one at a time. Access token, run the command. Access token, run the command. Okay, so let's try the script out. We can run it in the terminal, and of course we need to be in the workflow API directory. Let's use this convenient API hub feature here, open in terminal, and we're there. So now if we say dot slash workflow, we're using dot slash because the workflow file is in this current directory dot, but this current directory is not in our path. So we've just got to specify this one in this directory here. Thank you very much. If we run that, we get the result of this part of the case statement being active, as in we didn't specify any command. So it's just telling us what's in the commands variable. Okay, and that's what we get here. So what we can do as our first real call to the workflow script, we can generate an access token, okay? We can generate an access token and have a look at it on the command line. So rather than use the first API call to generate these access tokens, we can use the workflow script because we've got get access token. We've got a get access token function here that will do that for us. And as it's directing us to do here, We'll take a look inside the workflow script and look at the service key value retrieval section. Okay, it retrieves the value for the client ID, the client secret and the auth server, which we've had a quick look at already, but these are exactly the three things we need to request an access token as we saw earlier in this exercise. Now let's look at the function, which is up here and the function is basically using curl to do exactly what we did in here. Let's just move that away so we can sort of read that a little bit better. We've got the post request to the authorization server endpoint to slash oauth slash token. We're passing the client ID and the client secret in a basic authentication header. We're passing the URL encoded form content type and we're passing grant type equals credentials. So let's just close that, let's close that as well and close that just to clean up here. That's exactly what's happening here and, I, and I've described it also in this step. Here's a summary. 
dash dash dollar output. Dollar output is set to silent. This is an option for curl to say, basically don't give us any logging information. Just be nice and quiet and just give us whatever comes back from the actual response. Dash dash user will, will generate a basic authentication header for us and we can specify the value of the client ID and the value of the client secret. Don't forget these are the variables that we filled with values from the key file, from our service key file. We can use the dash dash data option to send grant type equals client credentials in the payload. The default content type that Curly uses actually is exactly the one we want. So we've not specified explicitly a default content type here. Where are we sending this request to? Well, we're sending it to the URL, which is $auth server, which of course is the value that we retrieved from the key file, the uaa.url, the auth server itself appended with slash OAuth slash token. And just like we saw in the response, in the first response we got when we requested an access token, the response returned to us, the body was of content type application JSON. So we're gonna pipe whatever comes back from that request into JQ to say, just give us in raw form, the value of the access token property. So that's what this is doing. So now let's run the command, get access token with the workflow script. Let's copy that. Let's paste it into there. And there we have an access token. Let's just move this up a bit. The raw output from this invocation of this command in the workflow script is exactly what we're looking for, the access token retrieved. So that a call has been made and a response has come back the client ID and the client secret were correct and correctly identified us, authenticated us to the authorization server, and we've been given an access token. As it says here, it doesn't really look that much different to the access token we saw before. And yeah, it is pretty impenetrable. We can't really tell anything from looking, looking at it directly. But that's where Jot, the command line, JSON web token tool that we installed right at the start of this virtual event. That's where it comes in. So remember that we installed a package called Jot CLI, but that package contains an executable called Jot that we've tried out already just on the command line. So what we can do is we can make sure we can still access Jot, JWT, there it is. So now what we can do is we can run that command again, dot slash workflow, get access token, let's clear the screen. And whatever that writes to standard out, we can pipe that into Jot. And let's see what we get. Much better. So let's make this a little bit bigger as well. So we can see, there's our invocation of the command, dot slash workflow, get access token, pipe whatever comes out of that into Jot and Jot will look at the access token and give us the details that are embedded within it. So that's great. So there's a whole load of details here, but what is relevant for us to try and work out why we can't access the API endpoint we're trying to call, the payload information is relevant. And specifically in the payload information, it's the authorities property, which is a list, an array of so-called authorities. And we can see here that there are sort of, they're sort of workflow servicey, task get, process template deploy, process variant deploy, and so on. These are the authorities that the access token includes right now. If we jump back, as we're instructed to here, to the start of this exercise and have a look at a little bit more detail of what it told us about this API endpoint, we'll see that it says here, scope, workflow, definition, get, i.e. that is the scope that is required if you want to make a call to this API endpoint. So let's jump back down to step three again. Yeah, and there it is. I've just repeated it here. Scope, workflow, definition, get. That scope, that authority 
for the sake of this particular exercise and in general right now scopes and authorities we can think of as the same thing is that scope workflow definition get in here no it's not so we need to address that if we want to be able to make a successful call to that endpoint okay so what we need to do is to update the workflow service instance with the list of authorities, the list of scopes that we actually need. Okay, and we can do that with the create uh, service. When we create an instance of a service, we can specify, let's just make that full screen for a second. We can specify parameters. We didn't do that deliberately. We didn't do that when we created the instance of the workflow service. But what we can use is an update command. Okay, CF update service. So we can do that now and we can supply the workflow definition get authority along with a couple of others as well which, that we'll need later on in this virtual event. Okay, so let's flip back to seeing the App Studio. And if we have a look at our workflow script we'll see we've got a function here called add authorities add authorities is expecting the name of a json file and it will use that json file with the minus c switch which of course is the thing we just saw here minus c parameters as json either a file or some raw json path to file there we see to update the service instance. Now, we've got in the repo another file called authorities.json. And we've got the workflow definition get, the workflow instance get, and the workflow instance start. The one that we are looking for right now is the workflow definition get, which we've got here already. We'll also want to list workflow instances and create new workflow instances so we might as well put those authorities in this list as well while we're at it so that's what we're going to do now so here's a description of the function so let's run it let's open up a new terminal again and let's just have a look while we run it let's just gaze upon the two things that are relevant here we're going to run the workflow script. We're going to call the add authorities function. We can, we can actually press enter here and it will, it will tell us that we need to specify a JSON file. So let's run that now. Yes, usage add authorities JSON file. So if we run that again and specify the name of the, the, the file authorities.json. Okay, so now it's told us that the service instance workflow light has been updated with these authorities. Are we sure that's happened? Well, we can check, can't we? We can just request a new access token now and feed it into Jot again and have a look at the authorities section in the payload to see if we can spot the workflow definition get authority. So let's try that now. Let's again, make this a little bit bigger. Let's close this one again and close this. Workflow get access token. And we want to pipe the output of that into Jot. Before we do pipe it into Jot, let's just press enter, let's get one. The access token, you know, it just looks the same as it was before or similar to what it was before. So it's not gonna change the outer appearance of the access token. But if we run that again and pipe it into Jot and scroll up a little bit, we can now see that we have a few more authorities, those three that we added. Workflow definition get is one of them. 
We can also see the workflow instance get and the workflow instance start that we also had in the authorities.json file. There. Great, okay, so now we can reattempt making the API call to the slash v1 workflow definitions endpoint. As we're feeling more and more comfortable in the terminal, let's have a look at the workflow script. And it won't come as a surprise, I'm sure to you, that we've got a function that will make that list workflow definitions call for us. It will make the call to the slash v1 workflow definitions endpoint based upon the resource server's API route, which of course, again, is coming from here, the workflow rest URL in the service key file. Well, in fact, we can see that here, the list workflow definitions, doing the same thing, it's using curl, nice silent output, no extraneous logging. It's sending an authorization header, in this case, not a basic authentication header, but it's sending the access token that we've just retrieved. The access token is retrieved by calling that get access token function. And it's making the call to the endpoint. So there's a quick summary of what we just looked at. So let's make the call now that we've updated the workflow service instance. Are we ready? There we go. We now get not HTTP status code 403 and user doesn't have sufficient permissions, but we get a response that sort of makes sense is what we're expecting. Here's an example. So you can refer to when you're reading through the exercises and we can see that there's evidence of our workflow definition. It's a workflow definition that we deployed. It's version one, it's ID is workflow. That's our workflow definition. Note, it is a list, okay? This is list workflow definitions. It is a list and the list is denoted by the fact that actually it's an array. So if there were more than one workflow definitions in our workflow service instance, we'd see those listed also within this square brackets here. So that's great. So finally, in this exercise, now we know how to request an access token. And now we know what we need to be in that access token. We're on our way and we can try out a few more things. Let's just have a look at what else the workflow script will do for us. Not much else, but certainly something. We can see here another couple of commands, list workflow instances and start workflow instance. These relate to other workflow uh, API endpoints also described in the API uh, workflow API for Cloud Foundry. Let's have a quick look at those. In the workflow instances group, we've got retrieve all instances by query parameters. So it's get a get to slash v1 slash workflow instances. And we've also got a start new instance, same endpoint, but we're using a different HTTP verb. So this, the, this is why we can safely think of these API endpoints as RESTful, because it's using HTTP as it was intended as an application protocol. So let's go back and try out the list workflow instances command. I don't think it'll come as any surprise that that list is empty. The list exists, the call was successful, but of course we haven't started any instances of our workflow definition. So let's start an instance using this command, workflow start workflow instance, and we need to give it, in fact, if we leave off the actual ID of the definition, it's gonna tell us, yeah, okay, you need to give me a definition and the definition name, which sort of rather unimaginatively I called workflow, 
it will call the endpoint. So what have we done there? We've run the start workflow instance command, which in this script has run this. It's another curl command. It's using the access token in a bear, as a bearer token in an authorization header. It's sending some JSON. We'll look at that shortly. And it's sending it where? To the resource server API root, to the slash v1 workflow instances endpoint. So we've made yet another successful workflow API call. What do we get back? We get back, effectively, here is the instance that has just been created for you. And it's a snapshot of that instance at the time of creation, which is why we see here the status is running. Okay, the, if you remember the workflow definition itself, which is here, doesn't do very much, it starts, then it ends. So we were very lucky to see it in a running state because of course, as soon as it starts, it finishes. So now let's list the workflow instances, which was the command we ran previously there. Let's move that up again. And instead of an empty list, we should see that workflow instance. But now, of course, you know, it's been a few seconds since we started that workflow instance. It's completed, so the status is now completed. So we're away, we're motoring. We've made many successful workflow API calls. We understand what's going on, all from the comfort of the command line too. Thanks for watching.